I very much enjoyed the presentations this morning, although I was horrified to learn from uh, Professor Loeb that I'm probably a bond trader, uh, maybe even municipal bonds. But in uh, any event, I'll proceed. So first of all, I'd like to kind of set a context um, for my discussion, which will deal with a relatively subtle aspect of the Alpha Centauri system that may nevertheless have an impact on some of the techniques we might use uh, to detect planets, um, exoplanets in that system. So um, I'm going to set this context um, in terms of uh, Jeremy Drake's uh, ladder of cosmic sexiness. So um, here we have the ladder over here. I'm sorry, the laser pointer is so faint. Um, but you see that stars are way at the bottom of this ladder. Um, because we know a lot about stars. And so, you know, they're, they're, we're sort of the bond traders in, in that business. Um, but you see in this, this diagram, it's actually already quite old. It's probably 15 or 20 years old, that um, exoplanets or planet hunting is already up pretty close to the top. It's impinging on, the, um, on what my colleagues and I call the dark side, you know, cosmology and that sort of thing. Um, I think if we were to redraw this ladder today, we would probably put exoplanets even higher up on this list. But I've drawn an arrow there, that, and because we actually know very little about exoplanets, they're absolutely fascinating. Um, but I've drawn some arrows connecting the stars to the planets. And, and this is for a number of, of fairly obvious reasons. First of all, exoplanets orbit stars, orbit their host stars, so uh, that's one very strong connection. Another more subtle connection is that stars can significantly influence exoplanets. And uh, for example, in our own solar system, when the sun was much younger and much more active from a chromospheric and coronal point of view, a very strong stellar wind, um, uh, very powerful X-ray emissions, it's thought that the sun may have been at least partly responsible for stripping away the atmosphere of Mars and turning a planet that supposedly in the habitable zone or close to it, um, actually very inhospitable um, at the end of the day. So um, planets can have a, a fairly significant impact. I'm sorry, stars can have a very significant impact um, on their uh, orbiting planets. But also stars can make it difficult to detect uh, these planets. And those difficulties are mainly associated with stellar activity. Now, what is stellar activity? Well, it's basically associated with eruptions of magnetic fields into the surface layers of stars. These uh, concentrations, strong concentrations of magnetic flux uh, cause uh, dark sp uh, star spots uh, to form. But surrounding those dark star spots are areas of, of enhanced uh, X-ray and ultraviolet emission. So it's a very complicated uh, process. These magnetic fields are spawned deep in the interior um, of stars like the sun that are convecting and rotating differentially. Um, and these fields uh, are produced uh, by what's called the dynamo mechanism, which remains um, enigmatic after uh, many, many decades of, of research. This dynamo is cyclic in nature, so the activity kind of comes and goes. In the, in the sun's case, it's on an 11-year time scale, and actually 22 if you count uh, polarity reversals um, of the field itself. So, um, oh, I should mention down here the importance of magnetic fields. This very nice quote um, is attributed to uh, Bob Layton. Uh, if the sun did not have a magnetic field, it would be as uninteresting as most astronomers believe it to be. Um, so here's... Uh, a movie of the sun. You can see the dark spots that occasionally erupt into the photosphere. Uh, if you look very carefully at the edge, uh, the limb of the sun here, you'll see that there's some bright regions that surround bright and visible light. This is a visible light picture. Um, so these dark spots have these brighter regions that surround them that are com uh, conspicuous at the limb. These are called plage regions, and they're brighter in visible emission uh, than the dark spots uh, if you integrate uh, the luminosity. You see there's a big spot group here. If you wait a few, uh, a few seconds, it will, well, we waited too long because the movie stopped. Um, that would have rotated around again. So there's some persistent 
um, behavior of these star spots, or sunspots in this case, um, but there's also a lot of um, eruption, sort of random eruption that occurs. And so the spots um, do not produce a completely systematic pattern in the light of the star, but this pattern is uh, modulated um, by the, uh, wait, let me go back here. Okay, so um, the point I want to make about this is the presence of these dark spots and the surrounding brighter regions um, as the star rotates can uh, introduce signals into the stellar spectrum itself um, that can confuse radio velocity uh, measurements. Spectral lines can become distorted um, by the presence of the spots or the additional light that's produced uh, by the Plage regions. This is also very important if you're doing astrometrical searches um, for planets, as we'll hear in the next talk, because the photocenter of the star can shift owing to uh, asymmetric distributions of these bright uh, and dark patterns on the surface. Um, so here's just an illustration of the cycles of solar activity. And now, uh, instead of visible light, this is x-rays. Um, and these uh, observations were taken by the Japanese Yoko satellite back in the 90s. And uh, you can see that over uh, uh, basically 11 year period, the uh, X-ray intensity of the sun varies uh, quite dramatically. Uh, so that at solar maximum, you see a sun covered um, by bright patches. Uh, these overlay the dark sunspots, but they're very bright in X-rays and UV emission for that matter. Um, but at the minimum of the cycle, the sun's basically dark in X-rays. It's a very high contrast measurement of the activity. So um, here's some movies from the Kepler mission. Um, I'll be showing three stars here of different rotation periods. These are stars that are all uh, much more active than the sun. And so at the top, there's a, uh, almost a two-day rotation period Here's a three-day rotation period, and there's uh, a slightly longer one. And so you can see these huge modulations in the light of the star. And then these big spikes here, which are those uh, directed energy uh, beams from other civilizations. Uh, well, that's, that's one interpretation. Other people think that they're just uh, super flares. It's like, super flares. These are civilization-destroying events uh, on these stars. Um, these, these flares have tremendous amount of energy. And you'll you'll uh, you know, hear about that in the popular literature. Wow, look at that one, that was really big. Um, but you can see that these light curves are really quite complicated. And they're changing all the time as, as uh, well, first of all, spots of groups keep rotating around, but then they evolve and, and um, uh, distort the, the waveforms here. Now, in contrast, the solar variations analogous to these, there's a 5% bar over in the corner. The solar variations are only about 0.2%, so really, really tiny, and sort of the width of these lines. And Earth transit is 0.01%, so it's, that's super small. And in order to measure transits of Earth-like planets on these sun-like stars, you have to stay away from this particular group of very active stars. So you want to go to much less active stars, and actually Alpha Centauri has two very nice examples. Um, and we just heard in the previous talk that um, there are two sun-like stars in a close orbit in the center part of the system, and they're orbited, perhaps, at a very great distance by uh, Proxima, which is a little uh, red dwarf star. Um, the system age is about the same as the sun, maybe a little bit older, um, and in particular, Alpha Centauri A right here is a near twin uh, to the sun. And being one of the closest stars, that's pretty nice. So I'm going to show you a movie now um, um, concerning X-ray observations that have been made um, in the Alpha Centauri system over the last two decades. Um, and the movie's a little complicated, but I'll, I'll try to explain it before I start it. And uh, so you'll see two dots here. Um, the red dot represents Alpha Centauri B, the K dwarf. The blue dot represents Alpha Centauri A, the sun-like star, or the more sun-like star. And this is their true separation at the particular epoch of observation. Now, when you see the dots, that's a simulation of what 
their activity levels would have been like in the uh, particular epochs, the size of the symbol is proportional to the X-ray emission from the two stars at that particular time. You'll see the stars, first of all, moving up to the right-hand side of the diagram or to the west in this um, uh, spatial plot. And that's the proper motion of the system. It's just flying across the sky. Um, you'll see some wobbles in these stars. And that's the parallax of the system. It's so close that the stars move by arc seconds, or an arc second, roughly, um, because of the, the, the parallactic motion as seen from the Earth. And then you'll also see the orbital motion of the two stars. So you'll see them drawing closer together, as we heard in the previous talk. Um, they're reaching a minimum orbital separation this year. And then you'll see them swinging around each other. Oh, and then the best part is that every once in a while, the dots will disappear, and they'll be replaced by real observations, by imaging observations, by three generations um, of X-ray observatories. The ROSAT satellite, which is a German X-ray mission, uh, XMM-Newton, uh, which is a European Space Agency uh, X-ray facility, and then by Chandra X-ray Observatory, which is a NASA um, obser great observatory. So here goes the movie. Oh, that's the first ROSAT observation. Now it's a month-long campaign by ROSAT, followed by another month-long campaign, looking every day um, at these two stars. You see, nicely resolved. That's the final ROSAT observation. First Chandra observation. Notice a very high spatial resolution. Then XMM-Newton comes along. Not so great spatial resolution, but you can basically see both stars well, except A has sort of disappeared right about then. And now these are the new Chandra observations that began in about 2005 and have continued to the present day on a six-month interval. The next observation is May 1st. Um, and you can see the stars drawing closer and closer together. You see B getting very active at that point. That's when the HARPS observations were made uh, that were referred to in the previous talk. And then finally, they just... Uh, Roll off into the sunset, okay. <laughs> well, the star set, I should say. Okay, and here's a, um, a diagram of all those observations. And in this diagram, the uh, positions are referenced to those of Alpha Cen B. And even though it's a smaller and less luminous star than Alpha Cen A, uh, K stars tend to be more active than G stars. Um, so I've just registered. Uh, so you can see, again, the um, the orbit collapsing in, um, in recent years. And Alpha Cen A, the sun-like star, disappeared from view in XMM-Newton in um, uh, 2005, in early 2005. It was completely, it dropped by a factor of 50 in X-ray count rate, completely unprecedented behavior um, in, uh, you know, for a solar-type star, certainly for the sun itself. And that actually inspired the Chandra program, although we managed to keep it going for a few more years. Um, I, I kind of apologize for this diagram, but it encapsulates everything I really wanted to say in this talk. My colleagues would call this an errors confusogram, and uh, it deservedly so. Um, but I'll try to explain it. So uh, these error bars, the, the dark points in the error bars, represent measurements of the solar coronal X-ray emission um, over the past two solar cycles, cycle 23, and current cycle 24. The error bars show the um, uh, variance of the measurements over 81-day averages, which is basically three solar rotations. And so you see the, the solar X-ray flux goes up, and it comes down, and it goes up again. Now, the shaded, the gray shaded area here is a three-cycle average. So the three, uh, or the two previous cycles to 23 plus cycle 23, and you can see that cycle 23 follows that average pretty well. However, cycle 24 here shows, oh, this hatched area is just the average repeated uh, into the future. And you see that the um, cycle 24 had a delayed rise, a delayed minimum, a delayed rise, and it has lower amplitude um, than the previous uh, cycle average. Um, OK, the dots are for alpha send A and B. Again, blue for A and red for B. 
And you see B has this really nice eight-year cycle going all the way back to the, the Rosat epoch. A, on the other hand, has behaved kind of peculiarly um, during this period of the, um, the XMM-Newton uh, darkening of the solar twin or fainting of alpha sen A, as, the, uh, as my colleagues at the Humberger Sternwarte call it, um, you can see that it had relatively flat, um, sort of an extended minimum behavior. And only recently it's just become, begun uh, coming up. Um, the, there are a couple of points um, to this um, diagram. First of all, here's the period uh, when the Muska and company um, recorded um, HARPS uh, spectra uh, that were then uh, used later to infer the presence um, of this uh, uh, Earth mass planet in a close orbit around Alpha Sen B, which is now um, has become uh, very, uh, very debatable. Um, but the other point is that, that Alpha Sen A and B sit very close to the sun in this diagram. So their activity levels are, in fact, very close to the sun itself. Um, so there are a couple of consequences of this. Um, so here's the you know, the, the obvious statement, um, you know, if you're going to go visit stars, this is the first place you go because these guys are so close and there are three of them all in one, one nice location. It's one-stop shopping, uh, as it were. Um, however, I mean, that's kind of the good news, but the, the more difficult story now is how are we going to find planets around these stars to maybe justify a journey um, to their neighborhood? And um, that's going to be difficult for two reasons, and uh, both alluded to in the previous talk, and that is that the separation between the stars just accidentally, because in their 80-year orbit, is reaching one of the minima, and uh, so stray light becomes um, a big issue. And uh, the, other, the other effect is the activity of the two stars. So here we have a little bit of good news, and that is that um, Alpha Sen B will be reaching a minimum of its um, activity state um, over the next couple of years, and we're pretty confident about that because it's been behaving so well um, over the previous years. And then the, um, the other point is that Alpha Sen A, unfortunately, is going in the other direction, so its activity is getting worse, and that will make detection um, of exoplanets around that star much more challenging, but not impossible. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Is it possible that the star spot activity cycle could be influenced by the other star? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I don't believe so, uh, just because the cycles are so disparate. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of work done on activity cycles in binary stars. It's mostly been in single stars. And the studies to date have been mainly based on uh, calcium H and K, which is an optical diagnostic, but is very insensitive, I mean, compared to x-rays, uh, to the activity. Um, so there's not a lot of good data out there. Now, however, um, there have been a number of claims that exoplanets um, can affect the activity of their host stars. And um, I would be very cautious about those claims simply because if there was a big effect, um, it would be quite obvious. And so if the effect is present, it must be extremely subtle because people have looked really hard to see that influence. And I mean, I, I haven't seen any convincing results yet. We'll take one more question from each microphone. After you. <laughs> uh, I'm sure I should know the answer to this question, but it's just a matter of curiosity. How close will Alpha Sen come get to the Earth, what's closest approach on its space motion, either in the past or the future? Um, well, the closest approach is, is like, what day is today? Uh, it's like tomorrow, you know. And it's about four arc seconds. No, I mean, no, I, no, in, Oh, oh, to um, the sun. oh, to the sun? No, 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 yeah, I mean, it's space motion. Oh, with spa space yes. motion. Um, 10,000 years or something. Let's see, the radial velocity is, so the space motion is more complicated than just the two-dimensional projection I showed. There's a third dimension, and that's the radial yeah. thing. And, and that's the bad news. 
because its radial velocity, oh, actually, no, it's There's minus. actually a, we'll it's wait minus, for the next speaker. It? There's a plot that shows exactly, that yeah. answers exactly that we'll question in the next talk. Yeah, so, it, so it, it's coming closer. <laughs> it's coming closer. How bright will it get? I guess is the other question, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It won't help us a lot. <laughs> it won't help us a lot. million years before we launch. Our exactly. Uh, yeah. Bruce, and then we'll move on to uh, so Peter's talk. Oh. be a question for Sorry. Peter as well, but um, this complicates our V measurements. Folk wisdom is that astrometry is less affected by sunspot, star spot type effects. And when I mean folk wisdom, I mean Mike Xiao used to say that very loudly to people. Is that considered to be true? Um, um, I, you know, I'm not an astrometrist myself, so I can't really answer that question. Um, but my, my naive, I, I, Jeff, I had a discussion with Jeff Kuhn, and, and we did a, a simple calculation that suggested that um, an asymmetric spot distribution could shift the photo center by 10 micro arc seconds. So if you're looking at, you know, at, a, at a micro arc second scale, that, that could be a problem. However, what, what helps you is that it, it's basically a source of noise. So if you do many, many, many measurements, then in principle you can remove that, that uh, you know, intrinsic source. You could invent a scenario in which there's a, a longer term signal as sunspots drift from the equator to the pole like right. they do in our system. But again, that's something you can imagine fitting and removing it when you're looking for a one year period. Yes. Okay. 